As we continue to take a look at the STS-135 mission, the final space shuttle flight. Joining me now is Glenda Brown. She is the lead spacewalk officer for STS-135, and she has more details about the single spacewalk that will be involved with the mission. Glenda. Thanks, Josh. Okay, I brought a whole bunch of information about our spacewalks on this mission and a little background on how we do the training, uh, give you a little bit more information on how we do space shuttle training in general. Um, for this mission, we have one scheduled EVA. We are also preparing and have consumables to support one contingency EVA for the International Space Station, as well as enough consu consumables to support two space shuttle contingency EVAs if those would be required to return the, the vehicles safely to uh, Earth. Our space uh, walkers for this mission will be Mike Fossum and Ron Guerin. They are the two um, crew members who are on the International Space Station at this time. This will be the first time that we are using the Space Station crew members to do our spacewalks during a docked mission. In the past, we've had a time when we've rotated through one of the uh, uh, International Space Station crew members, but this will be the first time we're using two of those. As you heard in the briefings earlier today, um, that is because of the challenge of only having four shuttle crew members on board. We definitely have to share the work. Uh, Mike Fossum has performed six EVAs in the past. He has uh, six, I'm sorry, 42 hours and one minute of spacewalk experience. Three of those spacewalks were on STS-121 with Piers Seller, and the uh, remaining three of those were on a uh, on spacewalks on STS-124 with Ron Guerin. Ron Guerin is his buddy on this spacewalk as well. If we were have to, to, have to uh, perform a contingency EVA on the International Space Station, we have also trained Rex Walheim to help out in the mix of all of those tasks that may need to be performed. Rex is also a very experienced spacewalker. He has five spacewalks. Uh, three on STS-110 and two on STS-122 for a total of 36 hours and 23 minutes. So a very experienced spacewalking uh, team available to us uh, to support our final space shuttle mission. Orbiter docked contingencies, those contingencies that would happen while we were still docked to the International Space Station uh, for the um, uh, shuttle Atlantis would be performed by Rex Walheim and uh, Mike Fossum. Sandy Magnus uh, would be supporting with robotic arm support inside. The orbiter contingency EVAs that would happen in the undock time frame, or that time after we undock from the International Space Station, would be performed by Rex Walheim and Sandy Magnus. While Sandy has a lot of experience on flying uh, previous missions, she is an EVA rookie, and this would be her first spacewalk if that were to be required. So I've mentioned that uh, we have a pretty heavy division of responsibilities. In addition to Mike Fossum and Ron Guerin doing the actual spacewalking, Rex Walheim will be supporting them from inside the International Space Station as their intervehicular support astronaut. He will be reading out all of the tasks uh, for that EVA, uh, the procedures, reading them out of the book, communicating with mission control, and um, helping them get through their spacewalk. Because there are only four shuttle crew members available, we needed to make sure that Rex would be able to take a break um, when required and uh, be able to be freed up to support any other shuttle operations during the EVA if required. So we've trained uh, one of our new astronauts, Kate Rubens, to ask act as the uh, ground IV. Um, she uh, trained with us at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. She uh, watched all of the spacewalks and has been instrumental in helping us with the development there. Um, she was selected in the last astronaut class uh, to be selected, and we're happy to have her um, preparing with us. Chris Ferguson is the commander for the mission, and he will also be supporting us as the suit IV. That's the intervehicular uh, officer or crew member that's on board that helps the crew members get into their spacesuits, helps take them through the procedures during the uh, time that they are uh, getting prepped up to go outside. He will also be supported by the Japanese crew member on the International Space Station, Satoshi Furukawa. Satoshi trained uh, throughout his uh, training experience with Mike Fossum here on the ground. The two of them became uh, quite close and uh, worked very well together in getting uh, prepared for the spacewalks. Uh, they were also able to train with Ron Guerin, and I'll show you some uh, video footage of that uh, a little bit later. 
Sandy Magnus and Doug Hurley, the pilot for this mission, will be operating the space station robot arm during the uh, spacewalk. Uh, Sandy with the prime responsibility and Doug uh, trading out with her also watching view camera views to make sure that the clearances are good between the uh, modules of the International Space Station and the robot arm. The experienced crew member that we will have with us in mission control to help out uh, with voicing up any uh, particular um, items that we may need, uh, corrections in the EVA or uh, helping us out with troubleshooting on board is Steve Bowen. He last flew on SCS-133. On our ground team, we have a lot of people supporting us, uh, supporting my console in the Mission Control Center. Darren Welsh is the uh, lead for EVA task. That means he uh, develops the procedures, helps with the training at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, and so on. He is assisted by Charles Goff and Scott Ray. The EVA systems officer lead for this mission is Grant Slusser. He is uh, Slusser. He is. Uh, in charge of preparing all of the spacesuits and all of the procedures related to that, as well as the airlock, uh, the Quest airlock uh, for a support of EVA operations. He is supported by Tamara York and Ernie Bell. Uh, also supporting us for one of the payloads that I'll be talking about later, the RRM, is Christy Hansen. She is the operations lead at Goddard Space Center for that, Goddard Space Flight Center for that payload. The Ormate Missy experiment, which I'll also discuss, uh, will be um, supported by Rick Caldwell here at Johnson Space Center. And the Canadians have been extra helpful in uh, supporting us with uh, troubleshooting of a grapple fixture. Uh, they brought down Tim Diltz from uh, Canada, and then Cesar Gonzalez will be here in the control center as well to provide assistance as required. Okay. So to get into the EVAs, um, I know we use a lot of compacted language here at NASA. We use acronyms for a lot of things, and so um, I thought I would define some of those right up front for you and uh, make it a little easier for me to talk through the rest of the uh, presentation. The pump module uh, that failed uh, last year and was replaced um, last fall will be one item that we will be bringing home. It is currently stowed on the external stowage platform number two, ESP2, and that platform is located in front of the Quest airlock and just to the starboard side of the lab. You'll see that in the videos later. Uh, the pump module itself is on, uh, on a support platform, which is called the LAPA, or the Large Adapter Plate Assembly. Um, you can think of it as a pallet that holds the uh, pump module for transfer. In order to be able to safely transfer that item to the payload bay, um, it's stowed very close to the aft bulkhead. There's a primary bolt that drives four pins that holds it down into the payload bay, and if those, um, that primary system fails to operate, we need to engage some contingency operation pins uh, that are on the aft side of the payload, very close to the aft bulkhead. In order to be able to reach those, we've developed some special tools. The new tools are called the continue, Contingency Operations LAPA tool, LAPA being that payload, or the uh, pallet that I was describing. Um, and the acronym for that is COLT, so I'll be describing those as the COLT tools. You'll know that those are the contingency tools that I was talking about. You can think of them as a uh, very long right angle drive assembly tool. Uh, let's see. When we've uh, completed operations with the pump module and transferred that to the payload bay, we will be transferring the robotics refueling mission payload, that's the RRM, we'll be transferring that from the payload bay up to the special purpose dexterous manipulator or the dexter robotic hand. That um, dexter will be positioned on the nader side of the U.S. laboratory on a grapple fixture there. The robotics refueling mission is, a, um, is uh, developed at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, it will provide uh, a demonstration platform for robotics operations on the International Space Station to practice satellite refueling, uh, as well as repair and servicing. The idea would be that you could take a robotic uh, mission, something like the Hubble Space Telescope, to an existing satellite, perform servicing operations on that satellite, and it can also be used uh, in the future for exploration uh, and interplanetary work. Um, following a robotics refueling mission transfer, 
we'll uh, move on to the ORMATE 3RW. That's the Optical Reflector Materials Experiment, Experiment Ram Wake Experiment. And it is part of the, uh, the MISI experiment, the Materials International Space Station Experiment. Uh, that whole system of experiment packages are stowed on the Experiment Package Assembly, or the EXPA, and all of that equipment is out on the external logistics carrier number two, which is all the way out starboard and zenith on the S3 element. From there, we'll move on to some of our newer tasks. On STS-134, they installed a grapple fixture called a power and data grapple fixture, or PDGF, onto the Zarya element. Uh, we refer to that as the FGB. Uh, that grapple fixture will allow us to have uh, robotic arm access to all of the Russian elements for the first time. And uh, while they were installing that grapple fixture, they noticed that there was a, a small wire that had gotten into one of the latch doors on that grapple fixture, and we'll be performing troubleshooting to remove that uh, small wire. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, finally, the uh, pressurized mating adapter number three is planned for future use for the universal docking system that's being developed to dock uh, additional uh, commercial vehicles to the International Space Station and eventually used further in exploration. That uh, pressurized mating adapter is exposed to space right now and gets a lot of sun on that, um, that interface and we are bringing up a thermal cover to cover that interface to help protect it until such time as the universal mating adapter can be developed and brought up to the International Space Station. Following that, we have several get-aheads including uh, the power uh, I'm sorry, the data connections or the RS-1553 uh, cable connections from that po uh, power and data grapple fixture, the PDGF that we installed onto the Zarya. Uh, that's the last uh, cabling that needs to be completed before that uh, uh, platform becomes operational for a base as the uh, robotic arm uh, platform. There are a few other items that we can, if we have a short amount of time left at the end of the EVA, we can reconfigure the port CETA cart. The CETA cart is our hand cart for uh, moving up and down the, the CETA rails on the front of the, the CETA MT rails on the front of the ISS. We carry equipment and crew members uh, on that CETA cart. Uh, it requires some reconfiguration. There are also some peak-shaped clamps that hold down the ammonia lines for the flex hose rotary coupler, which is part of the cooling system. Uh, we'll be removing those if we have time in preparation for maintenance on that item in the future as required. Finally, we have, uh, over the course of time, brought in a bunch of tools that were normally stowed outside in the toolboxes, and we'll be taking those back out to the toolboxes and stowing them there. As a part of that operation, or potentially separately, uh, if we have just a few minutes, we can retrieve a large cutter from the uh, airlock toolbox. Uh, the Russians have asked us for use of that uh, cutter on their next uh, Russian EVA that's planned uh, later this summer, and I'm sure you'll hear all of the details on that when the briefings come forward um, when that is officially scheduled. Uh, let's see. Finally, I wanted to mention that we are going to use the light exercise, uh, I'm sorry, the in-suit light exercise pre-breathe protocol on this mission. Uh, it was used for the first time on STS-134, and now we're taking it operational on this mission. Um, and as you know, the pre-breathe uh, protocols that we describe are a, a series of procedures that we use using a 100% oxygen environment. Um, the crew member breathes 100% O2, while in this case, performing some light exercise to help purge the nitrogen from the tissues in their body uh, to prevent the bends or decompression sickness during the EVA. Okay, and with that, I think we're ready uh, to begin the video. I mentioned that um, it takes uh, all of the crew members working together to uh, begin um, to perform all of these operations. So if I could have the first video. Uh, we'll start out at the uh, Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. Here you see Chris Ferguson beginning to help uh, Mike Fossum get suited up, donning the pants or the lower torso assembly of his spacesuit. Uh, that uh, 
that can be quite difficult sometimes, and we need to make sure that the boots are well seated onto the feet and that there isn't a, a portion of the suit that's causing a wrinkle to uh, cause discomfort during the spacewalk. Also, uh, Satoshi Furukawa came out to these uh, final training runs that has happened during uh, January and February. You can see Satoshi helping to don this space glove uh, onto uh, Ron Guerin in this uh, portion of the video. Uh, the last part of getting ready to get into the NBL to do training or uh, into the spacesuit to go out and do a spacewalk on orbit is putting the helmet on, making sure that's latched, making the final tool adjustments. Here you can see the pistol grip tool and the equipment tethers going onto the suit, as well as the safety tethers. Um, once the safety tethers are on, the crew members go to uh, ingress the NBL and perform operations there, or the uh, airlock to perform his spacewalk. This is video of the virtual reality simulator over uh, at Building 9 on site here at JSC. You can see Rex getting uh, the crew all together to uh, perform their training. Here they're donning the goggles of the VR lab. This allows them to actually see right into the computer program as if they were inside the program itself in the simulated environment. Um, Sandy and Doug will, uh, are shown here at the simulated robotics workstation. They can practice all of the moves required. Here they're getting ready to bring the robotic arm into position. As Ron Guerin demonstrates uh, the uh, sensors on the gloves in the VR lab, they uh, track his hand movements and allow him to actually feel as if he were inside the computer-generated program maneuvering the uh, payloads around while Doug and Sandy drive the robotic arm into the correct positions. Uh, you can also see in the upcoming segment, here you go, of uh, the simulated environment of the cupola workstation along with the visuals of uh, camera views that they have. I mentioned that uh, Sandy and Rex will be helping us out with orbiter contingency EVAs. They were also instrumental in helping us with final development on the scheduled EVA. Here you see them out at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory with Darren Welsh, our task lead, assembling all of the tools required for the spacewalk. Here they are getting their uh, drink bags ready to put into the suits before they uh, uh, don their uh, spacesuits to get in for their final training. This is video of the final space shuttle neutral buoyancy laboratory training that occurred on uh, June 13th. Everybody, you can see uh, everybody's really excited to be uh, participating in this final training event. Here you can see Chris helping Sandy to get into her suit and attach the uh, lower torso assembly to the uh, hard upper torso portion of the spacesuit. There's Rex uh, ready uh, to do his final NBL training in preparation for the mission. And with that, I think we can bring up our second video. And this video will show us uh, basically the uh, simulated uh, uh, VR lab simulation of the entire uh, spacewalk. So if we can roll the video too, please. Here we are at the completed International Space Station. It is indeed a beautiful and lovely uh, laboratory work environment uh, with its uh, power and cooling arrays uh, deployed. Uh, this is Atlantis docked for its final mission on the International Space Station. Mike Fossum will be egressing the airlock first, wearing the red stripes, and uh, Ron Guerin uh, will be EV-2 for the EVA. The first thing that Mike will do is head up to the external stowage platform number two and uh, position his crew lock bag so he can access the Colt tools that I was telling you about earlier. Uh, that's the location for the crew lock bag. And then he'll be removing the gap spanner that spans the distance between the external stowage platform and the lab, allowing for a little bit easier translation between those two elements when crew, mem crew members need to make that jump. Here's the location of the two Colt tools on the back of the LAPA or that uh, pallet that the pump module is installed on. While Mike is working on uh, installing the Colt tools, Ron will be uh, installing the foot restraint onto the robotic arm and then ingressing that foot restraint and getting into position to hold on to the handrails that are on the uh, pallet portion of the pump module assembly. Uh, 
Mike will come over and drive the primary bolt to release it. You can see here in the NBL uh, the relative size of um, the uh, pump module assembly relative to the crew member. Ron will move uh, on the arm out over the starboard just a little bit over the other ORUs that are on the ESP2 and then rotate it around to begin getting it into position where it can be docked down into the payload bay. You'll see another maneuver a little bit later. Once he's on his way to the payload bay, Mike packs up his tool bag and heads down uh, show, uh, to the payload bay uh, following the path shown flashing here in blue. You'll notice it's kind of a tight translation path between the GEM module and the MPLM that's docked for the mission. He'll maneuver down into the payload bay, translating to the aft of the payload bay. Uh, while Ron comes on the uh, robotic arm down into position carrying the, our, our, I'm sorry, the pump module. That pump module is about 1,400 pounds. He'll have to make uh, one more flip of the payload before he can bring it down into the payload bay because as you can see, the arm is gonna turn him upside down in order to get into position to berth the pump module into the payload bay. You can see that it is very close to the aft bulkhead of the payload bay, especially here in the NBL video. So Mike will be keeping a close eye out to make sure that uh, it's settling nicely in the back uh, near the aft bulkhead and down onto the adapter plate that's on the cross bay carrier of the payload bay. Once they complete um, installing the um, pump module into the payload bay, they'll make a quick check to make sure that all of the multi-layer insulation on the pump module is in good configuration. And then they're going to be trading out positions. Mike and Ron both wanted to have a chance to share the workload and to have a chance to ride on the robot arm. So uh, Ron will egress the arm and Mike will get on and then maneuver down into the bottom of the payload bay to retrieve the RRM payload from underneath the cross bay carrier. Here you can see it at uh, Kennedy Space Center during processing. You can see that it has all types of interfaces and tools on the payload uh, to demonstrate uh, various types of servicing once it gets uh, out to its final location on the space station. Here you can see uh, Mike pulling it uh, out from under the cross bay carrier with Ron keeping a close eye on clearances since it's very close to the uh, floor liner of the payload bay. Sandy and Doug will be watching all the views that they have available to them as they monitor those clearances and fly the robot arm from the payload bay back over to the lab nader where the Dexter arm is waiting to uh, receive the uh, RRM. Uh, during the stage, the Dexter arm, uh, Dexter uh, and the space station robot arm will take that uh, payload out to its final location. Once they're uh, maneuvered over to the lab, um, Ron will translate uh, back up out of the payload bay, uh, bring the tools with him, and meet Mike up at the uh, lab on the Dexter. He'll assist with uh, docking the RRM to the Dexter. And uh, when that's complete, uh, they'll both be free to move on to their next task. Here you can see uh, that same operation happening uh, on a special um, mock-up in the neutral buoyancy laboratory. Because this operation would happen very low to the floor in the NBL, um, we've uh, actually put another mock-up into the water to simulate the lab nader so that they can do it all in a heads-up position. Mike will uh, fly on the uh, robot arm with Sandy and Doug driving the arm back over to the ESP2 where he can clean up the arm, putting the foot restraint back onto the ESP2, uh, removing the uh, 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 worksite adapter for the foot restraint, and then cleaning up uh, any other uh, tools that they may have left on the uh, ESP2 as well as reinstalling the gap spanner. While he's cleaning up the uh, SSRMS, Ron will be making his way back to the airlock, uh, trading out uh, one tool bag for another and picking up the uh, Ormate tool bag. That uh, uh, tool bag also contains a camera that they'll be using while they're out on the uh, external logistics carrier number two. You can see his translation path here out to the S3 element. Uh, and he'll be uh, translating up to the external 
logistics carrier number two. He'll temp stow his crew lock bag and then get in position to install the ore mate. Uh, you'll also hear us referring to that payload as the uh, mini Missy. You remove the uh, cover from the uh, experiment package and then uh, take photos of the material samples that are on the payload itself. Here's a photo showing you all of the small little materials exposure samples. Uh, all of those uh, experiments will be used on future satellite applications as well as in exploration. He'll also take uh, photos from the other side of the LC2 to make sure he's got both, photo, uh, both sides of the payload uh, documented in their initial configuration. That payload will be retrieved uh, on a later mission uh, late next year. Let's see. From there, we'll move on to our get-aheads. And as I was describing earlier, if we could have photo three, um, this shows the general location on the Zarya um, of where the power and data grapple fixture, or the PDGF, was installed on STS-134. Uh, you can see um, that uh, the uh, U.S. segment is toward the left in this photo, um, which is um, the PMA-1 and then the node all the way to the left, and then the Zarya is all the way down to the right. And the next photo will show you uh, what we're uh, hoping to clear. You can see that small white wire circled there. Uh, those, the little door that it's stuck in is called a latch door. That's where the, um, the space station robotic arm, um, uh, the connectors, the power and data connectors from the robot arm move down and, and mate with connectors behind this little door. With that wire in the way, we're concerned about uh, potentially um, uh, the door being stuck and, and um, causing difficulties for the robot arm. So we'll, we want to clear that out of the way. If we can show the video, I'll show you how we plan to do that. Uh, as I mentioned, we had some of the experts come down from uh, Canada and help us out with uh, preparing this task. And it turns out that uh, clearing this little wire should be pretty simple. There you see the wire, and it actually is a, a piece of multi-layer insulation grounding wire that runs from the MLI that's on the exterior of the housing of the PDGF. You can see that all you have to do is pull away the, uh, the MLI and then insert a crew hook uh, from one of the equipment tethers into the latch door, that should free the wire, and then all you have to do is give it a pull from the outside, pulling it back to the exterior of the grapple fixture, where it should be, and then tucking it down into position underneath the little Velcro attachment tabs, making sure that it's snug and down behind the Velcro before re-securing the MLI. Once the MLI is re-secured, we can remove the equipment hook, and then we'll go back one more time to take a look into the connector, uh, making sure that there's no other foreign objects uh, or any other things getting in the way of that operation. Uh, while in the larger photo you can't see that the MLI uh, grounding wire is also behind one of the other doors, there is another photo that uh, we believe we've seen uh, where that grounding wire has also uh, crept up behind one of the other latch doors. So we're going to perform the same operation on the second latch door and then check the uh, two remaining latch doors to make sure that all of those are clear. Okay. Um, after that, we'll be going on to install the uh, pressurized mating adapter cover that I was discussing. So let's uh, bring forward photo five, and you can see where that's located. PMA3 is currently located on the port side of node three. Node three is attached to the port side of the node one. So the whole element is, is uh, pointed out toward port. Uh, the open end of it um, sees a lot of sun in this orientation. So if we can see the next photo, you can see uh, NBL video of the uh, cover that we've developed. It'll be carried to the work site in a in a special bag uh, carried out by the uh, crew members and then installed using some Velcro straps around the handrails on the what I'll call the snout of the uh, PMA. Finally, um, 
we're hoping to get to at least one of the get aheads and the first one on the list is the uh, 1553 data cable. So if we could see photo seven. Um, here you can see the grapple fixture kind of up in the uh, upper right hand uh, corner of the photo and then the yellow wire uh, there represents, it's actually two wires that are taped together uh, providing the uh, data connections uh, for command and data to the PDGF uh, platform for the space station robotic arm that could be used in the future to access the Russian elements. That's all I have in materials. So Josh, I think uh, okay. we can take questions if there's time. Okay, we'll take some questions from here in Houston. Just wait until the microphone uh, comes to you. We'll start off with Gina down here, down front. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Corot for Aviation Week. And I, I'm wondering about the uh, the ammonia in the pump module. Is is it um, evacuated at this point, or will they have to take any additional uh, measures to make sure that there's nothing escaping? No, we were really uh, pleased that that was accomplished on the STS-133 mission. They connected a um, ammonia vent tool to the payload and or to the pump module and vented all of that ammonia so there won't be any risk of ammonia contamination on this spacewalk. Okay. Thanks. Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, are, are um, the station, I'm sorry, the shuttle crew members, either one of them uh, trained for the station EVA if some reason um, the two station EVA crew members <coughs> could do the walk? Mm. Excuse me. Um, Yes, as I mentioned, uh, they're training for, um, they've trained up for all of the orbiter contingencies. And then since Mike and Ron had to leave Houston early to go to the International Space Station, we used them to help us develop those last tasks that came in after STS-134 and then also the pump module, I'm sorry, the PMA cover task that was developed very late. They helped us out with all of that. And they've gone all the way through that EVA uh, two times. Gina Sinceri, ABC News. I know after 134, Mike Fink and Drew Foistel came back with some pretty serious hand damage. I mean, have <coughs> you guys looked at that, and is there anything you can do to alleviate that for future spacewalkers? Have can you, you say you again what the damage was? Can you say again what the damage was? Can you say again what the damage was? Mike Fink and Drew Foistel came back with some serious hand damage. Okay. Um, so that is damage that we see, um, I won't say frequently, but occasionally. Uh, it tends to be a very tight fit on the gloves, and uh, the, the, when you pressurize the gloves, it makes them very hard. So imagine having your hand in a, in a very uh, hard container as you're trying to work all the time. So you end up um, almost bruising the tips of your fingers into the ends of the gloves, uh, particularly if they have a tight fit. Um, if you have a good overall glove fit, that helps a lot. Um, another thing that some crew members do if they have a particularly tight fit or uh, find that in training they're having these kinds of issues, um, there is a, uh, an acrylic coating that they can put on their nails and that helps prevent some of that nail and fingertip damage. Um, we've also done that. I am unfamiliar with, um, I just don't recall if Mike and Ron do that. Both of them have done these spacewalks before and neither one had reported that kind of hand damage in the past. So I'm not anticipating it, but if we have it, we'll deal with it as we always do. And I know, that, uh, and I know you had a bit of a problem with some soap on uh, Drew's visor. Right. That was fairly rare, but can you keep that from happening again? Uh, again, that is a thing that we have seen in the past. Uh, like you said, it's been rare, but even from the beginning of the program, even back in Apollo days, um, the best thing to use for anti-fog, uh, which is necessary, you don't want to have fogging on your visor, that would be, um, that would be very dangerous. Um, so we use the anti-fog, uh, it is a type of soap. Um, we apply it and then very carefully buff it off again. Even with all that caution though, occasionally you'll have just a little bit of it uh, that gets uh, trapped in maybe some moisture uh, that's in the suit anyway and then in a water droplet uh, somehow makes it from the, the visor to your eyes. Um, the way that we deal with that is just as we did, you just have that crew member stand by waiting till the time when, when that clears and just like soap in your eyes in the shower, 
Um, it does clear without water to wash it out. It takes a little bit longer, but uh, fortunately the tears do wash it out. Um, just judging by the animation, it seems like a lot of the robotics is occurring in close quarters around some of the structures of the space station and the shuttle. Can you characterize the complexity of the robotics operations that um, Doug Hurley and Sandra Magnus will be involved in? Yeah, well, that's very true. And um, we have uh, an entire team of robotics operators here uh, uh, led up by Troy McCracken. He and his team have... Um, very carefully developed all of those operations to give the maximum clearance that they can between all of the modules. Uh, then they very carefully train the crew members both at the VR lab as well as other simulators that are very high fidelity to make sure that they know which camera views to use to make sure that they've got good clearance. And then as required, they'll also call on the EVA crew members to help monitor clearances for them. Um, this. Uh, on some missions, the robotics operations are more tight than others. I would say this one, this one is a, a little more uh, challenging than some of them. You don't see the big uh, maneuvers through the wide open uh, space between uh, major elements that you do on some missions. Phil Harvey, CBS News. Um, how does life in the EVA office change uh, with assembly complete and with only a couple of EVAs a year, I guess, is the most you would expect? Uh, we're all... Uh, we're all anticipating that things will change, uh, and we're curious about how that's going to work. Currently, um, we lost uh, several uh, members of our team uh, in the April layoffs, and uh, we'll lose another uh, five team members uh, at the conclusion of this mission. Uh, first of all, uh, we already missed the ones that have left. Uh, they're all very highly qualified individuals, uh, excellent people to work with, and we'll miss the ones that are moving on uh, after the mission as well. Um, after that, we'll have standard maintenance operations that will go in uh, to the Mission Control Center and support uh, to maintain the suit uh, to make sure that we're ready to support any contingency operations. Uh, we'll also continue to work on all of the planning for um, the major elements that can fail on the International Space Station that could put us into a zero fault tolerance situation. We'll continue to work on those procedures back in the office. Um, and to prepare for those times such that we could be called in in very short order to perform uh, maintenance EVAs on the space station. What that means is we need to have a, a fairly uh, high level of preparedness across the board, so we'll need to be doing simulations uh, in preparation for those uh, uh, highly intense work periods when you'd have a, a contingency EVA that would be required within a matter of a few days or weeks. Um, so it'll be a sort of a, a steady state of work of maintaining preparedness, maintaining our training levels and proficiency levels, um, and then interspersed with some peak levels of activity that will be very intense for quite some time. So uh, that will be a challenge for us to maintain that proficiency. Um, in order to help out with that, uh, the space station program uh, will be interspersing some planned spacewalks uh, for um, rotating uh, payloads, for example, uh, installing uh, equipment that, uh, that can be changed out. And uh, then we can, there are some lower priority maintenance objectives that we can take care of during those periodic spacewalks as well. Uh, we hope to get at least uh, one of those per year and maybe two until the, uh, the new oxygen supply system comes up. Once that new oxygen supply system is up, then we can start falling back into a, a pattern of more regular EVAs and start knocking out some of the maintenance activities that we'll sure to be building up before we have a chance to uh, do more spacewalks. Okay. Yeah. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. Does Dexter keep hold of the robotic refueling experiment indefinitely? Um, does he put it down? Uh, and, and when will that actually be tested out, if you know? Okay, I am not, um, I'm not the expert on, on all of that, but this is what I do know. Uh, during the stage, after uh, ULS-7 departs, the uh, robotics operators um, working with Goddard Space Flight Center, they have a control center there. Those two groups working together will move the RRM from where it is on the lab out to its final location on one of the external logistics carriers. Um, somewhat like where, the, where you saw the ORMATE position, so a very similar pallet area to that. Uh, at that location, the Dexter arm will 
uh, uh, grasp some of the robotic tools that are on the RRM and then pull those out and they can perform all kinds of, of satellite type of maintenance. Uh, there's some multi-layer insulation that they can cut. They have a cutting tool. There are uh, different kinds of electrical caps and uh, um, as well as the refueling caps. Each one of those has a little safety wire that's very common on many of the satellites that are already operating in space. So they'll practice cutting that wire. Um, so those are some of the types of experiments that they'll be doing. And then in addition to the refueling, the refueling actually has, they have a, um, I, I do not remember the, the, uh, the liquid, that, uh, gaseous liquid that they are, uh, using as their, um, their fuel simulator, uh, but they can pump it from one tank to another, so they can hook up a little connector um, coupler and then pump the fuel through their tool back into the, uh, the experiment. The, um, all of the data for that comes down remotely, and um, the uh, operation of how all of that works um, will be communicated between the Goddard Space Flight Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, and then the controllers of the robotic arm and the Dexter hand uh, here at Johnson Space Center. So the technique and the expertise of all of those robotics operators working together is also a key technology development that they want to work on. Uh, the operations team for the robotics is just as important as the actual hardware. So they'll be checking out not just how the hardware works, uh, but also how their team works and how operations need to work. You could see how that could be important if we're uh, doing exploration. A lot of that work will be done uh, robotically, and we may need to take some of these same, te same techniques from the operations teams as well as the same tools, and we'll also learn a lot about how those couplers and the connectors work to see if there's maybe better ways that we can design those in the future to be more robotically compatible. Down here. Marsha. Um, let's see. I think altogether with its carrier, it is about 800 pounds. Just a second. I have that information right here. 820 pounds, including the platform that it's on. I thought Greg was going to give him the mic. But... Over here? To the left. Yeah, right over here. Hang on. We're going to go here, to the left. You mentioned that you'll be using the light procedure again for pre-EVA prep. I wondered if that proved so successful with the last mission that they met me, that may be the approach used from now on? That's what we're hoping. Um, it does uh, allow the crew members to um, move about freely the night before. As you know, we use, have been using the campout protocol in which we uh, put them into the Quest airlock the night before their EVA and bring down the um, pressure in that uh, in that section where, they're, where they are to about 10.2 PSI of pressure. And at that lower pressure that, uh, and then breathing the pure oxygen when they're on the mask helps them to purge the nitrogen. This other technique allows them to just go to bed in their own bed uh, at night and then get up in the morning, get into their spacesuits. And then um, really the only difference is that they have to begin these light exercises, basically just to keep your heart pumping and your respiration levels up enough that it'll help purge the nitrogen from your tissues. And yeah, that'll be great. We can save a lot of oxygen that way too, not having to pump down the, uh, the vehicle as well. Bill? Uh, yeah, Bill Harwood again, just a quick follow-up. Uh, do, you, do you have a ballpark number for how many people are in the spacewalk office? at the heyday of construction or any time you want versus what it's going to be after shuttle retire? No, but we can probably get those numbers from the astronaut office for you as a follow-up. Okay, Philip. Uh, Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Uh, just uh, I have a couple. The first one is, do you have any, uh, how much flexibility do you have in terms of how long you can go on this EVA? I mean, I know that there's a, you have a very tight timeline just in general for this flight. So. Can, can you go long on this uh, EVA if you need to? 
in preparation for every EVA, we make those decisions and rules ahead of time. And per our rules, uh, we can go to the full extent of the consumables available to us to transfer the pump module and the robotics refueling mission. Uh, those are hot, very high priority items. Also, the ORMATE experiment is also very high priority. The users of the data from that experiment really need to have that data back uh, sometime uh, late next year or the following year. So they need to make sure that they get that deployed uh, in time so that they can get the data back and then make their final materials choices for the vehicles that are gonna be using that data. So that also has a high priority and so we've decided we would be able to extend up to seven hours of EVA time to accomplish that item. If we were running ahead and we got everything done, we will not extend to get extra get ahead items done uh, unless we have already committed ourselves to an item and then something's not going as well as we had expected. We'll anticipate coming in very close to six and a half hours and we're gonna try very hard to stick to that. Our highest priority items on this mission, as Quatsi mentioned to you earlier today, are transfer of all of that hardware out of the MPLM. So we don't wanna take a long time with our EVA uh, we need to be able to get back inside and start helping out with all of that transfer. Okay, one more follow-up. Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, asking about uh, planning for this EVA, since you have the two EV crew are actually on orbit right now, uh, this seems at least from the outside very similar to the, the three the, the big 14 stage EVAs that you did last year where you have a lot of development work going, uh, going on, on the ground here. Uh, how are you how are you conferencing with the crew on orbit um, with the crew on the ground before they leave in terms of conveying some of the lessons learned uh, in the NBL runs with the crew on orbit? Okay, well, that's an excellent question. And we knew that that would be a challenge right from the very beginning uh, when we were making those selections as to which astronauts would be doing the spacewalks. You're right in that... Um, they had to do all of their training quite a long time before they're actually doing their spacewalk. For the um, Big 14 tasks that you mentioned before, like the pump module, uh, all of those very critical maintenance tasks on the International Space Station, we assemble a list of generic skills that they need to have to be able to accomplish any one of those. And then we show them the work sites that are particular to those items. And that is in their generic flow. Um, training flow. Both Ron and Mike got all of that training, uh, and so they had a good skill set to start with. Then we added this, uh, these, uh, the spacewalk and the primary objectives of transferring the pump module and the robotics refueling mission. Those objectives were added fairly early last fall, and that allowed them to each conduct uh, two full runs together and one separately. So Ron and Mike have each had um, a training session where they started their EVA and went end to end, at least through the part um, where they transferred the robotics refueling mission. The ORMATE payload was added after Ron left, but Mike got to help out with development on it on his final run that was in March. After that, as I mentioned, we used uh, Sandy and Rex to help out with development. We also used several other astronauts in the uh, astronaut corps that were already uh, scheduled to do NBL training for other tasks, uh, either planning for, for tasks downstream or just getting generic training in preparation for their own selections to um, space flight later. We were able to utilize them to help out with certain portions of the development, like the um, the PMA-3 cover, for example. We had a set of uh, three sets of two astronauts each look at that in the NBL and provide uh, a good idea of how it could be done. Then in terms of training um, um, Mike and Ron on orbit, um, we assembled uh, a video, much like what you saw today, uh, but with a little bit more detail. Uh, they also should have the actual uh, VR lab program. It's called Doug, and they should have that available to them next week to do uh, some final checks on uh, their translation paths, uh, the intricacies of how they move about uh, on the space station, where it's tight, what handrails to use, et cetera. Um, we've also been doing... Um, training sessions with them. We have already completed four of those training sessions, including two hours of procedure review each 
followed by approximately a half an hour of uh, space to ground tag up time with our training team here. So um, think of that as a, um, a video conference between space and the ground and it allows us to do that training, answer questions, uh, provide uh, demonstrations of the hardware. We can bring that with us and show them those items on, on television. They'll have their final training session on July 6th. Uh, that'll be two hours of training of uh, material review uh, followed by, um, I think we're hoping for nearly 45 minutes of space to ground tag up time. We are still working to try to get Rex tied in for that so he can uh, participate as well. He'll be in quarantine at the Cape at that time. Um, Let's see. I think that probably answers most of your questions. Oh, we did do a uh, dry run of the um, suit up operations and tested the aisle uh, protocol just looking through the procedures. We didn't go all the way through the protocol, but they got into their space suits and uh, checked the fit. And uh, we had, did have to make some adjustments on Ron's suit fit, uh, but he's dialed in now and uh, he'll be very comfortable for the EVA. Okay, we're going to wrap it up from here at the Johnson Space Center. Coming up next on NASA Television at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time will be the crew news conference with all of the astronauts for STS-135. So stick around uh, for that. And of course, for always the latest on the mission, you can log on to our NASA website at nasa.gov, where you can also learn about these uh, the spacewalk activity that Glenda's been talking about. So we thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here at 1 o'clock.